Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Listen to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Tomorrow, Roach, and I listen to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. In a startup in the Caribbean region, join Beyond the Beach online for a virtual panel discussion on Monday, March 20th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You and other attendees will hear from the founders of Jamaica and Cropmate about their experiences and learn more about the challenges and opportunities facing creatives and innovators in the region. Register today and see you soon. Indeed, people, register today. So that particular um, uh, online panel discussion will take, well, at the time of recording, it will take place tomorrow, the 20th of March, 2023, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you want to find out about the work that uh, some creatives and innovators are doing in the Caribbean uh, around around particular startups, uh, JA Maker and CropMate, et cetera, um, or J Maker, I should say, uh, do get involved. Do get involved. Go and have a listen. Um, if that's the the type of field that you are involved in, involved within within your personal work, and even if it's not, even if you're just somebody who's whether within the Caribbean itself or part of the diaspora, and you want to find out about um, how to get involved with startups in the Caribbean, or maybe even how to uh, start your own startup in the Caribbean, I highly recommend you go and listen or sign up for that event. The descriptor of how to sign up will be in the description below. So whilst you're watching this video or after you're watching this video, go and click the link in the description below and, and do get involved. Like I say, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and that's going to be held by the Beyond the Beach team. So um, highly recommend it, people, and get involved. My name is Marshall St. Patrick Hewitt, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. It's been a while. We haven't dropped anything on our YouTube channel for about, what, four days now, going on five days I've wanted to, but life sometimes just busy, you know, and it just didn't feel after like the ODI that I just wasn't, I wasn't about and I didn't want to just do content for the sake of content and rush something. Um, and yeah, now just felt like the time to drop something. This video um, is at the end of the third round of the West Indies Red Bull Championship. Um, you can go back into our archives and click, click, click sorry, Click the playlist for the West Indies Championship. That I've already covered round one. I've covered round two. So if you're only just getting into the West Indies Championship now, after round three, go back and watch the video for round one and round two as well to find out what's been going on in the first half of the competition. But as I as I said, the competition returned um, in midweek around what what day was? It? I think it was Wednesday this week around the fifteenth, or uh, all the games started. And first things first, what I think I'll just do is just remind people what happened in the three games in terms of who won. So Guyana beat Trinidad and Tobago by 143 runs. Um, the Wimwood Islands beat Jamaica by 181 runs. And the Leeward Islands beat Barbados by two wickets. So those were the actual results of the third round. And what that does for the table, as I just bring it up on my phone, the Guyana Harpy Eagles continue to lead the West Indies Championship, um, they have 49 points. The Wimwood Island Volcanoes are second with 37.8. The Leeward Island Hurricanes are third with 34.2. Barbados Pride are fourth with 31.2. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago Red Force are fifth with 24.8. And bringing up the rear are the Jamaica Scorpions with 15.4 points. So the Harpy Eagles continue to lead the way in the West Indies Championship. But as I do with these particular videos, I like to kind of just deep dive a little bit into the different games, look at who the standout performers were and what that may or may not tell us about West Indies um, selections going forward and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, the Red Bull Championship correlates to, generally speaking, test picks 
and who may or may not have a chance of getting involved in the test squad in the future. Remember, we only have two more test matches remaining in 2023, which will take place in June slash July against India as the, at the start of the new World Test Championship. So as much as I say, oh, yeah, this will link to, to test cricket, we don't even have that much test cricket coming up in this calendar year. However, we do have an A tour scheduled to take place. Details still to be confirmed. We've got an academy tour um, taking place. And ultimately, as much as I can say Red Bull correlates to test cricket, as as myself and Santoki have always said, West Indies um, um, pool, the depth of our pool, player pool, isn't deep enough for us to just say, right, if you produce in the West Indies uh, Championship, that just relates to Test cricket. I would argue that if you produce in the West Indies Championship, that might as well relate to ODI cricket as well. And obviously some of you will say, MASH, that doesn't make any sense, strike rate, this, that, this, that. But our pool isn't deep enough. Obviously we have Super 50, which will come later in the year. But good performance. At this stage in West Indies cricket, where we're struggling to find talent upon talent, and when I say talent upon talent, I mean talent that actually shows a level of acceptable consistency. When we struggle to find that, there's no point in chopping and chopping it up and saying, right, that's a good red ball cricketer. He can only play red ball cricket or she can only play red ball cricket, whatever it might be. Talent is talent. And as far as I'm concerned, once you're identified, maybe you can play all formats because, uh, like I say, our pool isn't deep enough. But let's just go through the games. Um, what I like to do is go through the games and then look at the top five performers and then kind of sum it up from there. So if we start with the Harp Eagles versus Trinidad and Guyana Harp Eagles versus Trinidad and Tobago Red Force in the Curry Chicken Chicken Curry Derby, Guyana won that very, very comfortably. First innings, they posted 324 runs, 350s within that particular innings. Leon Johnson, 62, Anthony Bramble, 56, Kevin Sinclair, 69. And there were even useful hands from Kemal, uh, Kemal Savary, uh, who got a century in the second innings, we'll get to that, with 44, and Kimo Paul with 46. Leading the way in the wickets for the uh, Red Force were the spinners. Imran Khan, 4 for 86. Brian Charles, 3 for 85. When uh, TNT came to bat in their first innings, they only made 160. Jason Mohammed, the only person to make a score of note with 50 of 101 balls. The guy on the bowling, Ronsford Beaton, we, we know about his action and the issues he's had in the past, but he's back this year. Four for 31, bowling some good pace. And, and Kimo Paul as well, three for 37. And of course, the evergreen Vasami Permol, three for 36. Vasami Permol, by the way, is now the top Wicket taker in West Indies domestic cricket, passing Nikita Miller. Um, Guyana in their second innings declared after 83 overs, 247 for six. They waited until Kemal Savary had made his century 101 not out of 222 balls. He was ably supported by Leon Johnson with 74 of 158 balls. Uh, that set TNT four, oh, sorry, the bowling, sorry, TNT bowling in that particular innings. Darren Bravo. <laughs> we tweeted about Darren Bravo. We were tweeting the wickets that he was getting and it went viral. Can't even remember now how many thousands upon thousands of people retweeted that, watched it, whatever it might be, with the the in-ducker, the, the, in, the, the, the swing bowling that Carl Mayers would be proud of. His, his, his uh, brother, DJ Bravo, would be proud of. Um, so uh, Darren Bravo... Uh, where is it? He picked up two for 23 in the second innings. So three wickets across the match. Obviously, Bravo has got the memo that the only way to get into the West Indies side is to be a bits and pieces all rounder. So that's what he's, that must be what he's trying to do. TNT needed 412 to win um, and they got nowhere close. Bowled out for 268. But Darren Bravo scored 95 of 170 balls and Amir Jangu was 50 not out. TNT batting has struggled this year. Um, obviously, we know that Yannick Yannick Karaya is now in South Africa for the for the for the limited overs. Josh De Silva may well be back in uh, Trinidad, but obviously he'd play the Test series. Maybe he wasn't ready to come and go straight into the TNT squad. It'll be interesting to see if he's included in the TNT squad for the fourth round because their batting looks like it needs someone. Solazano and Simmons just can't get going at the top of the order, and it continually puts pressure on TNT's three, four, five, and six to have to fire. But Bravo added 95 to the double, the twin centuries he'd got in round two. We'll, get, we'll come back to that later. So like I say, oh, sorry, and then with the ball, sorry, again, for Sammy Pomol, three for 58, six wickets across the match. 
Kimo Paul took five wickets across the match and Runford Beaton took six wickets across the match. So the Harp Eagles, in fairness to them, I think when you look at their bowling attack, Runford Beaton, Niall Smith, Kimo Paul, Kevin Sinclair, Vasami Permo, there's threats everywhere in that bowling lineup. I'm not saying they'll run for a side, but there's so much variation within that bowling lineup. Uh, and skill sets that is possibly not surprising that the Harp Eagles continue to lead the tournament. Their, their, their batters have shown up in every single match. Some once they they've shown up, someone has always put their hand up. If not, if not two players have always put their hand up when it, when it's their time to bat. Leon Johnson has announced he's going to retire, and yet still he's put his hand up with a twin fifties um, in this particular match. So Harper Eagles pretty much dominated that match against the Red Force. Moving across to uh, Wimmer Islands versus Jamaica Scorpions. Interestingly, for those who are watching this who don't know, so Wimmer Islands had actually, whether it was, was it mutual consent or was Shirley Clark sacked, but their head coach has gone and they've responded by winning their first game of the of this season's West Indies Championship. Let me just clarify with the league table if that was their first one. I think it was. It's one win and two draws for the Volcanoes. Let me just double check my thing. Yeah, one win and two draws for the Volcanoes. This is their first win. And this might be one of the reasons why the Volcanoes got rid of Shirley Clark because the the consensus, certainly when I speak to people involved around Wimbledon Islands cricket and those who are keen fans of Wimbledon Islands cricket, the consensus is this is one of the best sides they've had in a long time. And potentially over the last few years, they've been developing a really strong side. And there was a sense that they, they were underperforming with, with Shirley Clark at the helm. Be that may, and whether people would agree with that or not, Wimmer Islands destroyed Jamaica, winning by 181 runs. Uh, that game took place in Guyana at Providence. Uh, Wimmer Islands batted first, but up 2-1-7. Alec Athenes flew back from South Africa, straight back into the squad, not just to play, but to take the captaincy back again. 81 off 111 balls. Justin Gra Graves, sorry, 50 off 97 balls were the, the two main scorers in that particular innings. Um, with the ball... Jamaica, Derville Green back in the side, uh, five for 30. Uh, Nicholson Gordon back in the side, two for 26. Um, so 217 looked fine in, uh, until Jamaica came to bat. Jamaica, in reply, could only make 101 runs. Now, it's not just about Nkrumah Bonner, but obviously Bonner was back in the side, having been dropped uh, from the West Indies Test side, and it wasn't. It wasn't a good return to domestic cricket um, for Bonner. He only made 17 of 20 balls in that first innings. But their top six just didn't show up. Lug 16, Mackenzie 4, Bonner 17, Palmer, Captain Duck, Mansing 1, Aldane Thomas, Duck. Um, so by the time like Green and Merchant tried to save the innings, Jamaica were already 41 for six. So they, they did well to even get to 101. At that point, the game was pretty much done. I mean, Justin Graves with his with his medium pace swing, six for thirty four off ten overs. We'll get to Justin Graves later. Um, Ryan John, who was amongst the top five wicket takers in the previous two rounds, took two for thirty eight. Sherman Lewis back in the Wimmer Island setup, two for twenty nine. Um, so the Wimmer Islands again had threats, threats from everyone. Now you would have thought Wimmer Islands put up two one seven. Jamaica put one on one in return. So you're thinking, ah, oh, it's a low scoring pitch. Maybe that's uh, Jamaica are obviously going to lose because it's a really low scoring pitch and Wimmer Islands already have a 116 run lead. Well, knock me down if when the Wimmer, if when the Wimmer Islands came to bat again, they made 298 at a fair lick as well. 3.78 runs per over, like they wanted to play baseball. Gavem Hodge, 82 off 107 balls. Ali Kathanay's 97 off 100 balls. A runner ball falling just short of another century for this year's domestic championship. Um, and they were, again, they were the two main scorers. And the thing is, the, the Wimmer Island side, this is why I'm saying that I'm not surprised if Shirley Clark did get told to leave. Because you look at, okay, Jelani Robinson and uh, Johan Jeremiah, they're, they're up in the coming, okay? But then you look at their lineup. Kevem Hodge at three, Alec Athanes at four, Sunil Ambris at five, Justin Graves at six, Tevin Walker at seven. That's that, that's a good batting lineup. And this is what the Wimmer Island should be doing more often. They've got a very good team there. Um Leading with the ball for Jamaica was Patrick Harty, three for 62. Um, that was everyone else pretty much took a, a, a tap. And then when the Jamaica came to bat, they needed 415 runs to win. Uh, they made 233. This time, some members of the top six did show up. Mansing, 50 
off 190 balls. He looks like he's definitely got a Red Bull temperament. Aldane Thomas, 55 off 102 balls. And Derville Green, adding to his first innings, top score in the first innings with 35. I think he got, got 48 um, batting at number seven. But it wasn't enough. Again, the top four didn't produce. Lug 15, McKenzie 1, Bonner 17. Palmer 21. And it it just meant that when Mansing and Thomas came to the crease, Jamaica were already 68 for four. So they, again, Jamaica did well to even take it to 2-3-3, three, three, but well beaten by the Wimmered Islands. And then finally, the final game. What a game this one was. Over inside, this game ended in three days. Um, but how Barbados tr transpired to lose this match, Lord only knows. So Barbados batted first. Uh, this is a Port of Spain. They made 322 batting first. Shane Dowrich, the captain, an unbeaten 124 of 201 balls leading the way. That's probably already enough for him to get a test match recall. Don't be surprised, people. Okay, 124 not out of 201 balls. Kevin Wickham, the Academy product, West Indies A. Uh, the West Indies Academy product, 41 as well. And Chaim Holder batting at number 943. With the ball. Who led the way? Of course, Rakeem Cornwall led the way. 24 overs, seven maidens, six for 50. Leading the way as ever in domestic cricket. Again, if you've watched my videos for round one and round two, you, you know what I said. I said before the tournament started, we know what Jimbo's going to do with the ball. The only way for Jimbo to put real pressure on people like Chase is he's got to produce with the bat. But even then, you still have to give him the flowers for what he's doing with the ball. Six for 50 um, off 24 overs. So... When the women, uh, Leeward Islands then came to bat, they only made one five four. So at that point now, with a lead of nearly like a hundred and sixty, you're thinking, yeah, Barbados have this match in the match in the bag. In that one five four, only Jamar Hamilton got, and even then that score was subpar. He made thirty, right, off thirty five balls, just a whole bunch of twenties and ducks all over the place for for the Leeward Islands, right. With the ball, Dominic Drake's playing his first red ball game since 2018, three for 38. And then everybody else in the in the bowling lineup contributed. Jaya McAllister, two for 36. Shamar Springer, two for 48. Chain Holder, two for seven. Remember, though, with the pride, we must always remember this. Listen to all the players who would have been on West Indies duty and are currently on old and some in white ball duty who the pride can't select. Craig Brathwaite, uh, Raymond Reefer, Carl Mayers, Jason Holder, Kimar Roach, probably missing a bag of man here. I'm just thinking of those five straight off the top of my head. Roston Chase, that's six. Who else am I missing? Akeem Jordan, seven. All of these players have been involved in international duty. So we always have to remember with the pride, I'm not saying the players who are playing for the pride aren't good. That's not my point. But we always have to remember that the pride are always the team. Shea Hope, who's Shea Hope, sorry, Count Shea Hope, caps on the ODI side. The Pride are always the team that loses the most players to West Indies duty. And that, if, I'm not saying it's a B-side that the Barbados are playing. By no means, there's some good cricketers in there, but they are significantly weakened compared to other sides, right? But they still should have won the match. So now they have a 160-odd lead. They come to bat in their second innings and they get folded for 78. Now, bear in mind, Barbados lost their first wicket at 59 runs. They lost their remaining nine wickets, listen, for 19 runs. Have you ever seen such a thing? Let me read the scorecard. McCaskey, 29. Shane Mosley, 27. Then here we go. Jonathan Drake's three. Jonathan Carter, duck. Shane Dowrich, duck. Kevin Wickham, one. Shamar Springer, duck. Dominic Drake's two. Shane Holder, duck. Kamari Boyce, eight, not out. Jair McAllister, one. Who struck with the ball? Well, of course, Rakeem Cornwall, 7.2 overs, zero maidens, five for 19. But this is the more embarrassing part. And I say this with respect to Devon Thomas. Devon Thomas, nine overs, one maiden, five for 22. Now, Devon Thomas, we saw him bowl some handy, what, seam up, swing bowling, whatever you want to call it, in Australia, right? But it's a stretch to say that Devon Thomas is a dangerous bowler. If Devon Thomas is taking five for 22 in any domestic first class match, I'm sorry, but we have to ask questions about the standard of the team he's bowling to. That just can't happen. And that's not to demean Devon Thomas. Devon Thomas is a is an OK bowler, but he's not supposed to be taking five for 22. Barbados need to hang their heads low. So all of a sudden. 
Barbados, having started the second innings with 168 leads, suddenly had only set Leeward Islands 247 runs to win. Now, arguably, having seen the Leeward Islands only make 154 in their first innings, then to see Barbados get folded for 78, even then at that point you're thinking, well, Leeward Islands can't win this, can they? Yes, it's only 247, but the, the scores suggest that they can't make that 247. They made the 247 people. And to be fair, they should have made it at a canter because when Jamar Hamilton fell in the 42nd over, the Leeward Islands were 223 for five. They only needed another 24 runs and still contrived to only win by two wickets, right? But they still managed to get the win and it was a miraculous turnaround victory led from the front at the top of the order by Kieran Powell former West Indies international. Maybe he still thinks he can get a, a, a shot again. 104 off 109 balls from the top of the over. And Jamal Hamilton, the captain, hitting 55 off 70 balls to see them home. Um, actually, if anyone who watched that match, <laughs> when they, they needed four runs to win uh, with only Sheen Berridge left to bat and Rakeem Corner was dropped at second slip, and then I think he hit his next ball for four to then win the match. So it may even, they may even have lost the match, but for that drop, I think, I want to say it was Shamar Springer that dropped it, but I don't actually, I can't actually remember off the top of my head. But yeah, Rakeem hit the winning runs and the Leeward Islands won by two wickets with the ball chain holder led the way for Barbados, three for 38 from 11 overs, but they just, they couldn't, they couldn't close the match out. They couldn't defend two for seven and the Leeward Islands got the win. So that's a summary of the matches, people. Um, and if you haven't, if you weren't able to catch up with them, that's a basic summary of the matches. And like I always do when I do a roundup of the domestic champ, I like to then look at the top, what that means for the top five run scorers and what that means for the top five bowlers. Just, just with regards to, so what other narratives, who should we be looking out for, so on and so forth. Four of the batters in the top five were in the top five at the end of the second round. So... Not a whole lot has really changed. The orders change, but the names haven't changed as much. Ali Kathanez has retaken the lead in the batting ranks. 422 runs. He added an 81 and a 97 this round. 422 runs, an average of 70 after three rounds of the West Indies Championship. He's got 103 50s. Before I move on to number two, whatever happens for India, and I say this with chest, Alec Athanes will play in the Headley Week series at the end of this five-round West Indies Championship, right? Whatever happens when we go into India, Alec Athanes should be playing in the West Indies top six. I don't care who gets dropped. I don't care if it's Chase. I don't care if it's Reefer. I don't care if it's even Mayers. But whatever happens, Alec Athanes should make his test match debut against India. That's my personal preference. If he does not, I think it would be a backward step to only include him in the West Indies A tour, whoever they play against. He, given they've already called him up to, to tour South Africa, if they intend to drop someone from that West on that misfiring West Indies top six, Athenes should get first dibs. That's my personal view, right? Second top run score, Darren Bravo, 371 runs. Again, if you paid attention to the second round, Bravo made two centuries in the second round. He made a 95 not out in this third round. So he's currently got 371 runs and an average of 74 this year, 200s and 150s. Bravo is the only player in the West Indies Championship this year with 200s thus far. Um, there are plenty of people, myself included, who believe that Bravo, again, I'm saying both Athenes and Bravo, I've, I think they've already done enough. But should they continue to produce in round four and round five, I don't, Headley Weeks ain't even important anymore. Should they produce in round four and round five, both Athenes and Bravo should be in the West Indies test squad. Some Both should probably be in the team if we're going to make any changes to the West Indies top six um, for that India series. Matthew Nandu is third with 247 runs. He did not produce this round, but remember, he's only 19 years old. He made 10 and 33, I think. What did he make? Yeah, 10 and 33. So it was a low scoring round for Matthew Nandu, but that's fine. That's fine. Remember, he's 19 years old. His target for the rest of this West Indies Championship is to maybe find his way into the West Indies A Tour by the end of this West Indies Championship. Certainly, he needs to find his way into the Headley Week series as well. Leon Johnson, 
Having announced before round three that this would be his last season playing for Guyana, he then responds immediately with two fifties, um, 74 in the second innings and 62 in the first innings. And that immediately takes Leon Johnson up to fourth highest run scorer now in the competition. That's how easy it is. 219 runs at an average of 37. And those two fifties were his first two main scores of the tournament so far. I don't know if that says more about Leon Johnson or if that says more about the lack of batting quality that Leon Johnson can leapfrog straight into fourth place out of nowhere. Sunil Lambris was fifth last time out after two rounds. He's still fifth with 216 runs. This year he's got 216 runs at an average of 43 with two 50s. Again, he did not produce in this particular round. Um, he made 10 in the first innings against Jamaica and then 23 in the second inning. So again, there's an argument to say, so Sunil Ambris was fifth at the end of round two, despite not scoring any major runs, what, 33 runs in total in round three. No one has supplanted supp uh, supplanted him at number five in the run scoring charts. But Sunil obviously will be looking to try and score some big runs in round four when it kicks off um, on Wednesday next week. And then just quickly moving over to the bowlers. Top five wicket takers. Well, the first two names, who's surprised? If you follow West Indies cricket, particularly West Indies Red Bull cricket, there, you, there should be no shock whatsoever that numbers one and two are who they are. There have been numbers one and two in whichever particular order for what seems like the last six years in West Indies domestic cricket. And like I always said, I said it at the start of the West Indies Championship when I previewed the competition, we know what Rakeem Cornell is going to do with the ball. Currently, where Rakeem Cornwall has two, sorry, 21 wickets in the competition at an average of 12. Let me drink my juice. People will say that Rakeem Cornwall cannot possibly replace Roston Chase in the West Indies test side because Chase will make more runs than Rakeem Cornwall. And there may be merit to that argument. But the one thing I do know is Rakeem Cornwall will always out-bowl Roston Chase if you give Rakeem Cornwall the same amount of chances as Roston Chase. There is no doubt, in if you unless you've got no sense, there, is, there should be no doubt in any West Indian's mind that Rakeem Cornwall is the best off-spinner in the Caribbean. Yes, some people say, but Brian Charles has played for the West Indies A-team. It's his turn next. He's fourth in the wickets chart. But Rakeem Cornwall is the best off-spinner in the Caribbean. And if things were right, and if he tops the wickets charts again, and should West Indies want an off-spinner, it's got to be Rakeem. It cannot be Roston Chase. It, it, just, it just cannot, okay? I'd rather see a Rakeem Cornwall bowling in spin tandem with Goodakesh Multi than I would ever expect to see Roston Chase being Goodakesh Multi's backup spinner. Need I remind people that Chase took no wickets in South Africa? Okay. For Sammy Permol, second in the in the wickets charts, he took six wickets in this particular round. He's got 17 wickets at 17. But like I say, we we just we already know what Cornwall and Permol will do. Permol is now behind Multi. So it's gonna be very interesting because Multi obviously should have flown back now. Um, will they will Guyana? include multi for rounds four and round five but whatever happens per mole is now behind multi in the pecking order so i don't know what happens for per mole now going forward and how he wins his place back in the west indies side he could end the wickets charts as the top wicket taker and i still don't think he gets back in the west indies side but we'll see unless there's injury of course um third justin graves um actually speaking of which where is jamel warrican Sorry, sidebar there. For anyone who knows, get in the comments below. Where's Jamel Warrican? That's another um, player who should be playing for the Pride, but nowhere to be seen. And he didn't go to South Africa. He got he got sent back home after Zimbabwe. So what? Ah, oh boy. Anyways, Justin Graves, uh, 15 wickets, third top wicket taker. Do you not remember when Justin Graves opened for West Indies in OGI Cricket against Ireland? Someone explain what was going on then. What type of decision making was that? Who made that call? Anyways. Justin Gray's 15 wickets, uh, 15 wickets at 13. Um, I'd, I'd, I wouldn't be against seeing Justin Graves certainly play in the A tour. Where, wherever the A tour is going, I wouldn't be against Justin Graves getting his chance. Um, he certainly should be getting his chance in the Headley Week series. I'm just trying to remember what he's done with the bat because he scored some runs this year, Justin. 
He scored a hundred. Mm, no, it's not good enough. No, he's got one fifty. It's not good enough to force his way into any kind of all rounder position. Um, he's only got one fifty. He's averaging twenty four. But the question mark then would be: Is is Graves medium pace swing bowling enough to give him an A tour spot? Mm, you look in the comments below. Let me know. Graves is third. Brian Charles is four. Fifteen wickets. Uh, in the competition thus far for Brian Charles. How many wickets did he take this round? Three for 85. And what did he do in the second innings? Two for 60. So Brian Charles took five wickets in this round. He's got 15 wickets at 25. Like I say, if things are being fair, fitness test notwithstanding, the pecking order of off spinners in the Caribbean should be Cornwall gets first dibs, Brian Charles gets third dibs, and then there's no one else. Only then would I accept somebody then telling me, okay, maybe we'll look at Roston Chase. But Roston Chase should never be getting a pick in any West Indies test side with anybody talking about what his offspin can do when you have Cornwall and Charles who are arguably better offspin, not even arguably, who are better offspinners than him. So again, Brian Charles may well get an 18 chance. It all depends on how the selectors are treating Rakeem Cornwall at the end of this West Indies Championship. And then lastly, Ronsford Beaton. He, after this excellent round that he had for Guyana, he's now on 13 wickets and he's taken his 13 wickets at 16 apiece. Listen, we all know the story of Ronsford. If Ronsford can, I mean, he's 30 years old now, is it's never too late, right? It's never too late. Obviously, Ronsford has had issues with his action in the past, but if he continues to take wickets with his pace, it's never too late for anybody as far as I'm concerned. Because Ronsford's had time out, he's, it's not like Ronsford's body has broken down time after time after time. Generally speaking, it's been related to action, right? So he may well be a young 30-year-old in terms of mileage um, on his body. Big up, Ronsford. Good to see him on the wickets chart. Um, should he continue to take wickets through the tournament, then yeah, we can have the conversation about Ronsford beaten. So those are the top five batters, the top five bowlers. In terms of where we go from here, Again, we have to always look at these top five batters and bowlers because when we start to look at who gets into this Headley Week series at the end of round five and who we consider to play for the West Indies A team um, at the end of the Headley Week series and so on and so forth, we have to look at the stats, right? And the reason why we have to look at the stats and uh, big up Medvis, who made this comment on our, uh, on our Twitter handle, Medvis said a really personal comment. He said, Selectors only seem to use the stats when it's about promoting the players they want. What is very clear to me when you look at uh, domestic performances is that, and Rakeem Cornell is the best example. If Rakeem Cornell beats up the domestic level, then Rakeem Cornwall deserves to play for West Indies. It can't be that you ignore him beating up the domestic level and just say, well, boy, he's not good enough, because what's the point of the stats then? You might as well just say to certain players at the start of the year, it doesn't matter what you do in this competition, we're never picking you. So it, it should never be a situation where stats are only being used to promote certain players and only promote the agenda that you want to get certain players in the side. People have to know that should I perform, I'm going to make my way into the West Indies team. With the bat, Athenaise and Bravo are performing. They, they should be sitting there right now saying, should a spot become available in the West Indies top six, me, Alec Athenaise, and me, Darren Bravo, should be right at the top of the pecking order to replace them. Similarly, should the West Indian selectors ever say that Roston Chase doesn't cut it as an off-spinner, then Rakeem Cornwall right now should be saying, well, I'm the next best option. Otherwise, why am I playing this competition? Listen, let me wrap this one up, people. Next week, we've got another set of get round the game starting on Wednesday. Let me just get my diary and find them. So next week, starting on Wednesday, the 22nd of March, we have round four. TNT will play the Barbados Pride. The Harpy Eagles will play the Jamaica Scorpions. So that'll be top versus bottom. And the Leeward Islands will play the Windward Islands. That will be second. Sorry, third. That will be third versus second. So, I mean, uh, got, uh, Harpy Eagles have looked unbeatable this year. I would be shocked if Jamaica are able to give them a good game. But you just never know in uh, West Indies domestic cricket. All we know is there's no rules and anything is possible. I'll be Mashal St. Patrick Hewitt, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Didn't say it at the top of the show, but always say it at the end now. 
like, share, and subscribe to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Carib Cricket. And if you'd like to support the Caribbean Cricket Podcast financially for as little as one dollar, two dollar of whatever your currency is, or two pounds, whatever your currency is, head to www.patreon.com forward slash Carib Cricket, and you too can become part of the movement. Thank you as ever for listening to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Thank you and good night. We rule the cricket world. Now the rules seem Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one stop shop for all things West Indies cricket. By the fans, for the fans.